A very warm welcome to the first uh, Medical Humanities Colloquium in this semester. We've started this colloquium last semester and uh, it's actually the fourth talk in the series. So I'm really happy to have Professor Laura Salisbury here today, uh, who's our speaker and I'll introduce her. But before I do that, maybe just a, a few housekeeping announcements and a very quick intro to the Medical Humanities uh, Colloquy, the series that we have been running for uh, more than one semester now. So uh, usually the way we do this is we have a talk for 45, 50 minutes, and then there's question answer for another 20, 25 minutes. And uh, it's up to you whether you want to speak and feel free to unmute yourself in the Q&A, or you, if you want to you know, uh, write your question, in the chat box, again, feel free to do that. We will be able to relay the question to Laura. So, I mean, it's up to you, really. And I would request everyone if they, if they could uh, mute their microphones throughout the you know, talk so that there's no noise coming in from anywhere. Uh, that will be wonderful, thank you. And uh, now just a few words about the, the Medical Humanities Colloquy. As I said, that started uh, last semester. Uh, in IIT Gandhinagar and with uh, great efforts and help from uh, Swati Joshi, who's our doctoral student in the humanities and social sciences department in IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, it's been really her enthusiasm about medical humanities as a field and about her own work, of course, which is located in that field that uh, we should owe this series to. And uh, I've been playing my little role in uh, you know, co-organizing this with Swati. Okay, so this uh, particular colloquy uh, initiated by the department uh, is meant to open up dialogues between medicine, humanities, and literary and cultural studies by dwelling on their intersections that operate in the cultural field of medicine. The seminar series encourages discussions on trauma, suffering, loss, grief, recovery, coping mechanism, transformed identities, and so on. The presentations tend to cover various subdisciplines within the rubric of medical humanities, which is already like an interdisciplinary uh, you know, constellation. And we have, you know, we have already had talks on something like medical theater. Uh, we are interested in medical sociology, clinical anthropology, psychoanalysis, and medical literature. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a noise there. I would request everyone to kindly mute their microphones. Uh, the talks to continue, sorry, the talks conducted by the respective field experts and leaders will encounter and accentuate the granular details of clinical communication, clinical care spaces, familial care, written and oral narratives of the patients, etc., that seldom get highlighted in the data oriented clinical case studies. So that's just a little bit about the, the idea that has gone behind this seminar series. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura Salisbury. I've known Laura for a number of years now, and it's been great to work with her, to learn from her as a teacher, as a colleague, as a, as a fellow researcher. It's the work of Samuel Beckett that brought us together. And I'm, I'm really happy to have Laura opening the floor for us this semester. We hope to continue and have three or four talks uh, throughout the semester. Uh, so this talk that, uh, Laura will be giving is uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk very briefly about the talk and give you the title. But before that, let me formally introduce her. Professor Laura Salisbury is a professor of modern literature and medical humanities at the University of Exeter, where she works in the Department of English and Film and the in the Welcome Center for the Cultures and Environments of Health. She has published widely in the field of modern and contemporary literature, in critical theory, and in medical humanities. She has written and edited books on Samuel Beckett and on the relationship between neurology and modernity. With Lisa Brace, uh, sorry, with Lisa, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, I'm going to, be able to pronounce the surname properly, Breitzer, with Lisa Breitzer, hopefully I got that right. Laura is currently co-directing a five-year project funded by the Wellcome Trust called Waiting Times that examines what it means to wait in and for healthcare. So again, I mean, this is so pertinent to 
in everything we're trying to do here in terms of this series. She's also the president of the Samuel Beckett Society. She's going to talk about something which is uh, perhaps most timely at this point. We are still in the middle of the pandemic. Unfortunately, I almost feel frustrated to use that present tense because it's been present for the last, four, the last two years. And it seems like it's been there always. And that's the elasticization of time, I guess. Uh, so she will be talking about doom scrolling and anxiety in pandemic times. The title of her presentation is on not being able to read doom scrolling and anxiety in pandemic times. So over to you, Laura, and I will now share my screen so that we can have the slides up. Thank you so much, uh, Orca. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, just to give an audio description of myself for those who might need it, I am a white woman in my 40s with dark brown hair and glasses. And I would very much like to thank Orca and Swati for the invitation to be able to talk to you um, here today, both of their work on um, in various fields is so interesting and so it's really an honour to be able to present in a forum that they have organised. Um, so lately, there were, oh, just before I start, I think I've got slightly longer than uh, Orca said, maybe more like about 40 minutes, but I hope that will be all right. That's, that's um, perfectly fine. That's okay, fine. so <clears throat> lately, though it hasn't been clear exactly why, I have lost my ability to read. No, this isn't quite right. I've probably been reading more words than ever, but I have struggled to focus my attention. Next slide, please. Um, through 2020 and 2021, as I, alongside millions globally, have waited behind the front line of COVID-19, my tally of words has accumulated via anxious doom scrolling of globalized social media and 24 hour online news. Feeling like a distraction and something peculiarly driven rather than drifting, it has broken up my capacity to place myself in sync with something like a literary novel. So my question today is, what is the function of this anxious mode of reading that became so bound up with the waiting time of the pandemic? And why have Don DeLillo's short literary fiction, The Silence from 2019, and Sadia Hartman's online critical reworking of W.E.B. Du, uh, du Bois's The Comet seemed readable when other texts have not? Is it simply that both are thematically concerned with a hiatus in the rhythms of historical time caused by catastrophic events? Or is there also something in their anxious textuality that is revealingly aligned with Doom Scrolling's affordances? Although the dominant readings of doom, uh, reading of doom scrolling is that it must be unhealthy, addictive, determined by the monetization of attention and an obstacle to mental flourishing. Today, I want to think about it as a symptom in the psychoanalytic sense of an individual psychic solution to a conflict. But I also want to ask whether there is in doom scrolling an attempt at a more sort of social cure, something that uses a latent animating force in reading uh, as a reparative orientation towards the renewal or rebuilding of connections that feel increasingly frayed, ruptured or broken. Cure is probably the wrong word, though, for the symptoms attempt to mitigate distress is not exactly an orientation towards health. Instead, it might better be understood as a partial and sometimes failing inclination towards care of the self and maybe of others. To put it differently, I'm wondering whether this mode of anxious reading while waiting is an attempt to, quote, maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible, to use Joan, Joan Tronto's famous definition of care. Even as doom scrolling is clearly associated with care in a much older sense, care as worry, lament or sorrow. Next slide, please. So lockdowns, uh, shelter in place orders, social or rather spatio-temporal distancing, health service collapse and the feelings of fear and grief experienced as deaths mount all have profoundly altered individual and social senses of time, forcing disruptions of work, leisure, and the repetitions and rituals of the social in ways that have produced and exacerbated mental distress for many. One key effect of experience in the time of the pandemic, but that has also seemed insistent in the collective mental life in parts of the world inhabiting late liberalism, I would say, has been anxiety. Next slide, please. Etymologically, anxiety is derived from the Latin anxietas, worry, solicitude, extreme care, 
or over carefulness. But as it emerges in the 15th century in English, the word takes on a particular association with temporality. Anxiety becomes a worry over the future or about something with an uncertain outcome. Anxiety enters the clinic <clears throat> in the latter half of the 19th century as a subset of symptoms within conditions such as neurasthenia and melancholia. In 1980, however, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 3 um, uh, of the American Psychological Association introduced a distinct category of anxiety disorders defined by excessive anxiety and worry, apprehensive expectation, adding in later that these experiences would need to have been going on for at least six months uh, in order for the diagnosis to hold. So uh, next slide please. Joanna Burke summarizes the difference between fear and anxiety in these terms. The word fear is used to refer to an immediate objective threat while anxiety refers to an anticipated subjective threat. As she puts it, in fear states, um, oh, I've just lost my, ah, there we go. Uh, in fear states, individuals are consciously able to take measures to neutralize or flee from the dangerous object, while purposeful activity fails individuals whose subjective experience is anxiety. So when anxiety is something that troubles the clinic, then it is defined by excess, too much tension, and it goes on for too long. Care and paying attention continue, but measured purpose drops away. Clinical insights into anxiety have frequently emerged from social experiences of crisis and war, even as anxiety tends to get fixed within an individual subject and their psychic landscape and history. In 1926, in the wake of World War I, Sigmund Freud described how anxiety neurosis, as with all symptoms, is produced in relation to a danger situation, either external or internal. It is an attempt to manage in this present a psychic dis disequilibrium emerging from a reaction to a possible future. But Freud argued that anxiety, oddly, uh, oddly even the anxiety experienced by soldiers in war, is determined by a traumatic structure laid down in the past. Anxiety is always orientated towards a future, but the capacity to tolerate the future's uncertainty is determined by expectations built on experience. Will the future deliver something that will have been worth the wait or a repetition of deprivation and violence? Waiting for something that evokes the possibility of annihilation and a breaking apart the psyche cannot imagine itself surviving will produce anxiety automatically. But Freud's more counterintuitive claim is that anxiety also functions as a signal that enables defences to be mobilised. The individual can, quote, foresee and expect a traumatic situation of this kind, which entails helplessness instead of simply waiting for it to happen. Next slide, please. And then, so this is Freud. The present situation reminds me of one of the traumatic experiences I've had before. Therefore, I will anticipate the trauma and behave as though it had already come while there is yet time to turn it aside. Anxiety is on the one hand, an expectation of trauma and on the other, a repetition of it in mitigated form. Signal anxiety here takes care of the self, mitigating helplessness by enabling the psyche to feel that there is yet time perhaps to retreat or to act and wait in a safer, more sheltered place. Waiting produces anxiety then, but the repetitions and compulsions of anxiety also seemed aimed at producing a world in which there would be time enough to wait, a yet time where annihilation might be avoided and another kind of future imagined. <clears throat> But the qualities of yet time are laden with contradiction. As C.N. Nye puts it, anxiety is always aligned with both the temporal dynamics of deferral and anticipation. There is an attempt to manage threat by proroguing it, but producing yet time also risks feeling stuck in the interminable. I think I'm on the next slide now, but uh, can you just move forward? Oh yes, that's right. So waiting for doomsday. In his autobiography, Leonard Wolf described the wartime psychology of September 1939 as markedly different to that of August 1914. And he says, next slide, people of my generation knew now exactly what war is, its positive horrors of death and destruction, wounds and pain and bereavement and brutality, but also its negative emptiness and the desolation of personal and cosmic boredom, a feeling that one is endlessly waiting in a dirty gray railway station waiting room, a cosmic railway station waiting room with nothing to do but wait endlessly for the next catastrophe. 
perhaps we also wait differently now to how we waited in the first wave of COVID-19 with a more realistic sense of the pandemic's positive horrors, but also a clearer sense of the negative emptiness of enduring ongoing disruption, the ongoing disruption of lived time. For many, time slips its usual markers. As Matthew Arthur writes, uh, next slide please, pandemic short circuits flows of goods, bads and bodies. Um, its ethics are diffuse, everywhere impinges, time feels caught between aftermath and looming recurrence, impasse, interruption, repeat. Wolf's grey well railway station waiting room invokes cigarette ash, dulled pallets and the smog of mid-century Britain, while Arthur's glitched time flows evoke unstable connections suspended in the blue-grey light of the digital. But where they come together is in a shared idea of what I'm calling grey time. Because grey has no dialectical opposite, as Rebecca Comey has noted, it's achromatically composed of black and white in various shades of intensity. Grey interrupts a feeling of contrast that might support dialectical sensations of temporal progression. Neither simply black nor white, nor coloured with easily uh, stable or easily determinable affect, so crisis reds or bluesy longing. An idea of grey time perhaps captures the experience of living through differences in, in intensity that might accumulate, but not quite the differences in kind that seem to allow the dialectical passage of time. Of course, differences and distinctions can always be made. Black and white are not merged in uniformity, People wait and have waited across the globe through experiences of the pandemic that play out in radically uneven ways. For news of deaths that do not touch everyone equally, for differing experiences of selves or others in sickness or in situations of mental and physical distress and danger. Experience of enduring immaterial conditions that might be profoundly impoverished or reasonably comfortable. And yet one thing that has perhaps been shared by those connected to global systems of digital information and who haven't been on the front lines, so those compelled to wait rather than act, is practices of making digital contact with a glut of information while in a state of radical uncertainty about what the data might reveal. So doom scrolling was an OED word of the year in 2020 and is described by Matthew Arthur as, um, next slide please, compulsive swiping through pandemic related headlines, graphs and tweets. It is an urge that practices the body into dystopian feeling, an effect of becoming indebted to the way things are through gesture or a bad news world interfacing the body as a tick. Doom scrolling is killing time as an investment in feeling on top of things, a feedback loop of testing for encroachment. How close, how long, how much, how bad? Again, it mistakes use patterns, forms of connectivity and attentional modes for reality as a symptom of its own debt. Arthur captures the atmosphere of compulsive reading in its peculiar braiding of quantification, how close, how long, how much, with qualitative judgment experienced effectively, how bad? How does one register and quantify the encroachment of loss or the proximity of disaster to the self, while also keeping a qualitative connection with catastrophic losses that in the moment of doom scrolling are primarily re registering in the bodies and lives of others? Can one keep loss in its place while also making it count? As Arthur suggests, doom scrolling, like anxiety, has the effect of seeming to kill time by aiming at its suspension. But paradoxically, it also makes time in its rolling and roiling. This contradiction might be untangled a little by paying some attention to the English word that has settled on this anxious reading. The doom in doom scrolling may obviously evoke death, destruction, or some other positive horror. From, the point of, from this point of view, doom scrolling is an attempt to reassure oneself that the worst is not yet here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, from King Lear. The worst is not yet, so long as we can say this is the worst. But doom is derived from the Old English dom, meaning statute, law or enactment. The book that recorded the extent, value, ownership and liabilities of assets in England in 1086 was later called the Doomsday Book because it signified a final reckoning against which there could be no appeal. The question of how much is answered, as in the Last Judgment itself. The contemporary sense of doom as fated destruction tracks in the long shadow of the Christian notion of doomsday as the dissolution of all worldly things, of, all, of worldly quantities, but the preservation of certain accumulated qualities. 
on doomsday, God renders final judgment on the world and all debts are paid. Following the harbinger of plague and pestilence, God calls time, as it were, on the quantity and quality of time itself. Next slide, please. Doom scrolling is not simply a synonym for wasting time on the internet then. It's killing time has a particular if paradoxical orientation. Yes, people doom scroll to test the encroachment and threat of positive horrors to produce a sensation of time in which we might yet turn aside from a threat bearing down. But they also doom scroll to try and manage the negative emptiness of a world seemingly without qualities. We doom scroll in the hope that the world itself would have moved forwards even if we have stayed still, pivoting towards a, mo a moment where accounts might be settled according to a form of dispositive judgment. So, quote, a permanent separation of the evil and the good, the righteous and the wicked. And that's from the book of Revelation. It might also feel like a form of action when we seem compelled to stay still, to become a bystander with all the guilt that that entails. In the time of waiting, doom scrolling puts time between the subject and a threat, but it also looks to firm up accounts, to attach judgment and attention to the world so that things might come to count, settle or be settled in a final reckoning where there will be no further loops, repetitions, recursions or reframings. This might represent an attempt to wrest events back into historical time in which progress, even if it's just measured, uh, even if it's just temporal distance rather than development, can be measured by a movement of a present event into the past. We will be anchored in time rather than drowned. There might even be for some an apocalyptic hope, not for chronological progressive history, which now seems impossible, but that the experiential grey time of, quote, lost futures and future losses, which is Rebecca Comey's phrase, might finally come to an end in doom as destruction or extinction. However, if doom constitutes both a gesture towards and hope for judgment and calling time, scro scrolling seems to pull in the opposite direction towards endlessness. Although all paper texts and codex books have a potential endlessness, only limited by the actions brought into contact with them, scrolling blurs the embodied contact with the material ends and breaks of texts. As Jack Hartnell has suggested in relation to the idea of the continuous page, the unfurling of scrolls frequently has a ritual function invoking an unbroken relationship to the past. Next slide, please. But he also notes the preference for scrolls in medieval Europe for keeping financial, administrative and legal documents. Um, and he suggests that this might have a more practical origin. Um, a roll consisting of glued membranes of unbroken parchment could be much more easily expanded to contain new information that the hermetically, than the hermetically stitched and bound choirs of a codex, allowing for the ready growth or, con or contraction of working documents and records. Next slide, please. Uh, the idea of a continuous page um, may invoke the continuity of an idea of history itself or tradition or even religious truth, but it can only do so by concealing its other imminent temporal qualities, its ends, beginnings, excisions and insertions, rereadings and recursions, just as the continuity of a digital network of links obscures its gaps, elisions, additions and obliterations in the literal sense of writing over or striking out script. The scroll's endlessness does not sit securely in relation to historical or chronological time, con continuity or totality then. It speaks instead to an endless folding in of more time and more information. Next slide, please. Scrolling anxiously is a form of killing time by adding in yet time, vigilantly accumulating information and affects that have different sensations of intensity within the impeded, elongated, unsatisfying, and paradoxically arousing and frightening present. But this hypervigilus cannot help but defer the possibility of judging sufficiently that one could ever settle accounts and call time on events and experiences. Hypervigilance, which has been identified as a symptom of anxiety disorders, includes exaggerated scanning behaviours whose purpose is to detect activity and threat. How much, how close, how bad? But of course it can also increase anxiety considerably. But by pressing a little on the vigil element of hypervigilance, just as I've sought to reconnect doom scrolling to the idea of a last judgment, we might understand a little more about this particular use of attention. I think we're a bit ahead on the slides now. I think we should still be on a 
Ah, there we go. Um, in the history of Western temporal understandings, Reinhard Koselleck describes how time in pre-modern Europe was figured in relation to a Christian worldview that invoked, quote, a constant anticipation of the end of the world on the one hand and a continual deferment of the end on the other. From monastic cultures of patience and endurance to the invention of tarot tariffed penance as a physical space of purgatory in the 12th century, various temporal practices of waiting and vigilance emerged that emphasized the importance of attending in the end times to the imminence of the final reckoning or doomsday. A daily temporal culture of vigilance developed in Christian monastic and particularly Benedictine life that used vigil from the Latin vigilia, wakefulness, watchfulness, even sleeplessness, to account for practices of praying through the night to await the second coming of Christ and not to be caught distracted or drifting in, uh, at the moment of judgment. The vigil, though often painful to the self, was a way of taking care of a relationship towards the future, figured as the eschaton in which time itself would come to an end. According to Koselec, however, modernity shifts from prophecy away from ideas of the future stabilized by the last judgment in which time moves into an eternity, the nature and structure of which is already known, towards an idea of prognosis in which human action can affect and create an unknown future by seizing historical time. Now, I think that doom scrolling both makes something of and withdraws ideas of time. Doom scrolling, doom scrolling partakes of vigilance, but it is always excessive, unbounded, repeating itself because there is no longer confidence in a final judgment. Doom scrolling also feels like an attempt to wrest experience back into progressive historical time and get things moving forwards, but its affect is felt to be only an illusion of forward movement in a time when progressive his, history a fantasy. Still, I want to note in doom scrolling a certain attachment to hope and a future. It signals this in its wish to be involved with and attached to a world of others, in its odd mimicking of a kind of conviviality and le leisure, in its back and forth that seems a substitute for sustenance in all conversation, and in its closeness to the forms of informational labour that for many of us now rep represent the world of work, a work that is as much about social reproduction as it is about production. Um, I think we need to go on to two slides now onto the Lauren Ballant slide. So I think that doom scrolling has a kinship with Lauren Ballant's articulation of what they describe in Cruel Optimism as slow death. Ballant writes about particular modes of eating associated with obesity, not simply as addicted, but as forms of lateral agency that have a particular exhausted relationship to sovereignty and autonomy in neoliberal times, defined by what Bifo Baradi described as, quote, the slow cancellation of the future. So Ballant describes this lateral agency as an experience of floating sideways, as body and life are experienced not only as, quote, and next slide please, projects, but also sites of episodic um, intermission from personality, inhabiting agency differently in small vacations from the will itself. Ballant does not represent this as healthy, but acknowledges an orientation towards care for the self in the desire to produce an intermission in conditions that feel intolerable in relation to life projects that cannot be achieved. There is also an orientation towards care in the potential for conviviality and sustenance in acts and experiences of feeding and eating. There is radical ambivalence, though, for, to use Berlant's terms, slow death is a zone of ordinariness where life building and the attrition of human life are indistinguishable and where it is hard to distinguish modes of incoherence, distractedness and habituation from deliberate and deliberative activity. Next slide, please. Um, although Cruel Optimism is not a book centrally concerned with the literary, Berlant notes as a literary scholar that temporalities of slow death self-continuity rather than self-extension, don't seem to fit with novel time. As a literary scholar, I have also noted how the compulsion to doom scroll has interfered with the forms of temporal attention required to read certain literary fictions, the holding multiple elements in mind projected into a future of understanding. Nevertheless, I did find myself able to read Don DeLido's very short novel, The Silence. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is perhaps because of the text's own formal tracing of the pulse of anxious textuality. 
um, let's say something about its rhythms somehow matched my doom scrolling. The novel is set in 2022 as Jim Cripps and his wife Tessa Behrens are flying from New York, uh, from sorry, from Paris to Newark. Their plane crash lands as the world's digitally networked technologies are arrested. Diane Lucas and her husband Max Stenner are waiting in their Manhattan apartment for Jim and Tessa to arrive for their Super Bowl party. One of Diane's former physics students, Martin Decker, waits with them. In terms of the form of the novel, part of its anxious affect is the fact that, as Anne Enright has noted, um, next slide please, information comes in packages and it is hard to know what is important, what is not important, and what feels as though it was written by some automated process, one that writes catalog copy for stuff you possibly need but don't really understand. The book's insistent telegraphic pr prose, in which distinctions between information are flattened out, invokes an anxious sense that there is little possibility left of choosing or understanding what is important without the algorithms that funnel attention in a digital world. Reality is experienced as a rush of data points, buffering and refreshing, but bringing little hope of differentiation or understanding in terms of hierarchy, hierarchizing information. The text's insistence on listing reconfigures DeLillo's previous interest in hyperconnectivity, you know, what we see in something like white noise. Here, information accumulates, but patterns or conspiracies don't readily emerge. There is instead uh, a sense, to use one of the phrases from the book, of our immersion in a single sustained overtone. Too much information, which is usually a synonym for too much affect, ends up flattening out the technical distinction between information and noise. Instead, the text op offers up too much of everything from too narrow a source code, that's a quote, in which, as in experiences of grey time, differences in kind are flattened out. But here, even the differences in intensity that might be said to mark the affective experience of digital life are leeching away. Instead, words and experiences accumulate, but are immediately distributed rather than signifying, adhering and passing. The, quote, single sustained overtone, end quote, is a particular balancing of accounts that writes out human modes um, of perceptual differentiation. Well, thanks for moving the slide on, thank you. It evokes and performs reading as scrolling over rather than a mode of absorption, penetration, attachment. The silence is concerned with a crisis, but feels less of a, this feels like less of a turning point than an intensification of the ongoing anxiety of slow death and what Ballant calls the crisis ordinariness of neoliberalism. So um, this is a quote from White Noise. Missiles are not so soaring over the oceans. Bombs are not being dropped from supersonic aircraft, but the war rolls on and terms accumulate. Cyber attacks, digital intrusions, biological aggressions, anthrax, smallpox, pathogens, the dead and disabled, starvation, plague, and what else? Power grids collapsing, our personal perceptions sinking into quantum distance. Are the oceans rising rapidly? Is the air getting warmer hour by hour, minute by minute? This is fiction in which narrative assumes the form of doom scrolling, in which there is an anxious attempt to settle accounts, but multiple possibilities remain in play. Jim is a claims adjuster, but it's precisely the ability to measure and adjust losses and articulate stable accounts of value that is suddenly unpicked and flattened out. Martin speculates that the event must be linked to, quote, data breaches, cryptocurrencies, money running wild, not a new development, no government standard. Of course, there is no gold standard anymore, but the trust, securities and reputation that stabilizes global fiduciary relationships has also been unpicked and replaced with something that seems ominously desutured from any human capacity to account for value. In this gray landscape, this gray time, or what DeLillo calls the insomnia of this inconceivable time, the text understands that there might be a strange longing for a, quote, war that we can see and feel. Is there a shed of nostalgia in these recollections? The blackness or indeed the whiteness of fear can indeed sometimes be imagined as a relief from ongoing anxiety, if it can be felt as a prompt to action, but it is an anxiety that endures. In Ugly Feelings, C.N. Nye identifies anxiety as something that comes to replace melancholia or depression as the male intellectual's, quote, sign signature sensibility in the 20th century. 
for Nye, anxiety produces distance from implicitly feminized modes of absorption and asignificance, even as it turns away and distances itself from even its own aversion. But one might also note in Nye's examples of anxiety as the male knowledge seeker's distinctive yet basic state of mind, a very particular form of agency that might also be racialized as white. This is not to say that only white people are anxious or doom scroll, but that the distance of anxiety rather than the greater immediacy of fear might also be a privilege that plays out across racial lines. Martin's closing grey time fantasy is of gaining some existential freedom, and um, he says, it may be time for me to embrace a free death, frightened, time to be sit and be still. All my life I have been waiting for this without knowing it, knowing it. So Martin imagines, perhaps like Martin Heidegger, that anxiety is an existential orientation to the world that would enable him to seize his own situation, his relationship to death and therefore to being. But then perhaps he is not one whose loss is chronically adjusted to the fearful reality of being seized by premature death. On the 5th of June 2020, in the middle of the pandemic and 10 days after George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, Sadia Hartman published a piece of writing online that retold W.E.B. Du Bois's short story, The Comet, while interleaving moments of interpretation and contextual expansion. This transgeneric piece of creative critical writing was entitled The End of White Supremacy and American Romance, and it was a response to the chronic crisis of violent premature Black death in the United States and the Black Lives Matter protests that were reverberating around the world. Du Bois's short story was published in Darkwater in 1920, and Hartman's essay revisits this speculative fiction written in the wake of the 1918 influenza pandemic and the race-based atrocities of uh, the Red Summer of 1919. As Hartman notes, uh, next slide please, the influenza pandemic of 1919 does not appear in dark water, perhaps because microbes see, seemed benign when compared with the bloodletting of the Red Summer or because for every year between 1906 and 1920, black folks and cities experienced a rate of death that equaled the white rate of death at the peak of the pandemic. For some then, the mass destruction of lives was never a deviation from the ongoing way things go. Medievals read comets as harbingers of crisis even do, and so it is in Du Bois' uh, story as New York is poisoned by the gases held in the comet's tail. A black man, Jim, survives this miniature apocalypse because he's mistakenly shut in the vault of a bank. He emerges to find a white woman, Julia, seemingly the only survivor beside himself. So if we think about the silence, we've got two New Yorks, two Jims, two catastrophes as things fall from the sky, rupturing time and history, two interracial couples, two meditations on how things might suddenly be leveled and what might emerge in the wake. The silence and the comet are separated by a hundred years, but are suggestive counterpoints for a discussion of how lives might become to understood to count. In the comet, Jim is sent down to the bank's vault because he is quite explicitly of no account. Um, I think, next slide please. It was too dangerous for more, no, no, sorry. We had, anyway, this is a quotation from Du Bois. It was too dangerous for more valuable men. We learn and don't, uh, we learn, and judgment and trust follow lines scored by a history of white supremacy. And this is again from Du Bois, few ever noted him, save in a way that's done. Jim finds himself shut in the bank vault, confined with shackled gold that squats ominously alongside him. As Hartman points out, next slide, the crypt harbors the secrets, the disavowed knowledge and missing volumes on which the great financial edifice rests, the same history that has relegated Jim to the bowels of the earth. In this sunken place, slavery is the thematic ground. He is confronted with his origins and pricked by the realization, the uncanny feeling of an equivalence or doubling between the gold in the trunk and the Negro in the vault. When Jim re-emerges, the comet has killed most of the city. He knows enough to trust how his survival will be made to count. Quote, if they found him here alone with all this money and all these dead men, what would his life be worth? Although Jim is initially called the messenger, he endures beneath the comet that does not augur the birth of Christ. Instead, he finds himself in a messianic time of the last judgment where he and the surviving white woman, Julia, might become a new Adam and Eve in an unfallen world. 
Julia quotes Proverbs 22, 2, as worldly differences are leveled. The rich and the poor are met together. The Lord is the maker of them all. But as survivors return to the city and find Julia alone with Jim, so does the usual mode of accounting. Where is he? Let's lynch the damned. And then a word that neither Du Bois nor I will say. Um, Jim survives to be saved or condemned by a white. Hartman's essay models her method of critical fabulation, which enables her to go back to a previous text or history and suture back in accounts and materials brutally excised from the record. She stitches back in the history of the Red Summer lynchings of 1919, alongside a history of premature black death and further a further hundred years of race-based atrocity. Sometimes she uses Du Bois's words, sometimes she adds, adds quotations from Black Thought, and often she glosses with her own words. The text has the texture of a repetitive going back and going over, or stitching material back into the scroll of history and literature and criticism, a way of making things count when they have been given little account. These are stitches in time, in the present, that serve to repair the past and save something for the future. Such a method sits alongside speculative fictions such as, oh, next slide please, Nisi Shaw's Everfair from 2016, um, which um, revisions the past to avert the brutal deaths of millions caused by colonialism in the Congo. So we're on the next slide now as well. Um, Shaw materializes the possibility that being a good ancestor to those in the future might require looping back to remake historical time responsively and responsibly to care for ancestors in the past. Shaw writes back into the past, understanding that the trauma has already happened, but working as if there were yet time to turn historical atrocity aside. Hartman's critical fabulation in returning to the past and retelling the story also explicitly stitches in materials to the fabric of Du Bois's text, repairing particular historical excisions, suturing things back into scrolls as stores of information and experience, the accounts of the world from a point of judgment that insists on measuring, calculating and accounting for the sins and losses of the past. The effect is the revivification of a particular history and a certain reparation, the possibility of and orientation towards another kind of future. So this is my uh, final section called reparative doom scrolling. So next slide, please. It perhaps doesn't even need stating that doom scrolling might be understood through what Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick influentially called paranoid reading. But it's easy to forget that Sedgwick's essay begins with reading during a pandemic, the AIDS crisis, and the possibility of a conspiracy against marginalized people that might lie behind it. Sedgwick's response is to suggest that critique and the hermeneutics of suspicion might not be the only or even the most important mode of reading produced by a pandemic. Interested as much in what knowledge does rather than simply reveals, she follows psychoanalyst Melanie Klein in differentiating, differentiating between two positions that are formed in infant life, but most humans find themselves occupying and oscillating between, and, the, and this is the paranoid schizoid and the depressive position or the reparative position. Writing in 1946, Klein describes the child's loss of complete identification with the primary object, usually the mother, as an inevitable part of development. But in order to preserve the idea of the good lost object that can be held in mind, the child splits it spatially, keeping the good object at some distance from a bad object that attacks both from the inside and from the external world and is felt to be responsible for painful, inevitable experiences of frustration and loss. The movement from this spatializing paranoid schizoid position to a depressive position that recognizes the aggression of the attack on the loved object and looks remorsefully to repair the damage done, to put together back together over and through time, signals an emerging capacity to understand the loved object in reality as separate uh, and neither wholly good nor bad, but both good and bad. So for Cedric, Klein's paranoid schizoid position is, uh, underst is quote, understandably marked by hatred, envy, and anxiety, whereas the depressive position is, quote, an anxiety mitigating achievement or a reparative process. The paranoid schizoid position, as it becomes a paranoid reading, has a particular relationship to time, Cedric argues. Next slide, please. The unidirectional the unidirectionally 
future orientated vigilance of paranoia generates paradoxically a complex relation to temporality that burrows back and forward. Because there must be no surprises, paranoia requires that bad news be always already known. If loss and its attendant humiliation can't be stopped, it must not emerge as something that takes the subject and their object of inquired, inquiry, quote, as a surprise. Sedgwick, Sedgwick understands in paranoid reading the need to block through vigilance the humiliation of being exposed to the loss and scarcity that haunts Klein's paranoid schizoposition. The power of critique and judgment thus becomes a reading tool used to forestall or prorogue loss as if, as in Freud's anxiety, there were yet time to turn the trauma, trauma and humiliation of loss aside. So one reading of doom scrolling then is that psychically it strives to hold on to a kind of knowing, a particular and unalterable account in an information ecology in which trust about the nature of reality itself is profoundly fractured and everything can be overwritten according to different points of view. But I think there is also something more aligned with Klein's depressive position, something more reparative to be found in the production of this quote, yet time. Something in the yet time of doom scrolling that can be positioned in relation to what Sedgwick calls after Foucault, the care of the self, the often very fragile concern to provide the self with pleasure and nourishment in an environment that is perceived as not particularly offering them. Pleasure, nourishment, but here also I want to argue there is a sense of how a reparative reading might be orientated towards judgment as justice. Hartman's work of critical fabulation stays in the time of repetition and stitching in, of going back and going over, as a way of doing justice to loss, critically, but also to a possibility of a reparative writing and reading. Hartman's work perhaps enables us to see in the going over and stitching in of doom scrolling something that has the potential to reach both beyond addiction or traumatic return and beyond the fantasy of a new form of linear history that one could bring up on one screen and that doesn't tickle upwards and away in the next moment. I think it helps me to see how doom scrolling might sometimes in its own strange way then be a practice of care of self-soothing, yes, but also of affirming an attachment to the world. Doom scrolling speaks to a desire to animate, attend to, contain, and hold on to something that might count within the overwhelming swell of data funneled by the monetization of attention and overseen by surveillance capitalism. Of course, it's a risky strategy in which the container of the mind is frequently overwhelmed and swamped. It is often easier to feel care as woe and lament uh, more than care as the making and remaking of the world. In her book, Enduring Time, my waiting times colleague, Lisa Baretza, finds in the ways in which the, uh, those living in late liberalism endure time in waiting, staying, persisting, delaying, repeating, preserving, enduring, maintaining. And she finds relational practices of care that to use her terms, take a certain care of hope as progressive accounts of history and the future have frayed. They take care of hope by going on attending to the gaps and losses of the world, resuturing attachment, to use Baretz's terms, even in the face of the catastrophe, catastrophes of the past and in the future. Staying in the climate of Baretz's thinking, doom scrolling is also, I think, in its own flailing and failing way, an attempt to resuture attachment uh, to a world through and as time for it affirms the minimal relationship towards the future that is always imminent in any relationality, in any moving outwards from the self. Doom scrolling is often something that is felt to detach people carelessly from their immediate surroundings, becoming a slow death replication of the severing of social bonds that have not survived neoliberalism's penetration of the life world. It can also all too easily slip into the hyperconnectivity of paranoid reading. But I think there is also in it a form of weak, fragile utopianism that is worth taking care of, a utopianism paradoxically present in the anxiety and endemic to this world. In the desire to produce yet time, there is a gesture of hope that time itself and the things that subsist within it might yet be attended to and contained. <laughs> 
And my hope perhaps is that in this yet time, one might understand one's health to have more complex, less sovereign and more lateral and commingled relationships to the world, rather than just the experience of being overwhelmed, swamped or having one's bodily and social systems or borders hijacked. Alongside all the other things doom scrolling is, one might understand it as an attempt to attend to bonds that may be increasingly broken in terms of traditional modes of connection and kinship, but can be glimpsed and understood as connected in a world that is both human and more than human. I think that the kind of waiting undertaken in doom, doom scrolling speaks to what Baretza calls an understanding of the permanent non-severance of selves, others and institutions from what sustains them, end quote in a human frame, but we might also say the radical commingling that is the reality of the more than human world, a commingling of data and algorithms and viruses and bodily fluids and flesh and air. The minimal gesture of the finger on the mouse pad or phone, miming a pushing away from the self into the world, might just be read then not as a dismissive swiping left that severs a careful relationship to time, Doom scrolling might yet be understood as a gesture of non-severance that refuses to foreclose relationality as it insists on making attachments count. Attachments to others, to information, to a world of exteriority, and to the hope that the future itself will not simply be a repetition of the uncountable catastrophes of the past. Thank you, that's me done. I'm sorry that went on a bit. Thank you so much, I'll just stop sharing so that we can have you here on screen. Sorry, just give me one second. That was, sorry, my video is still not. Okay. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. That was a, a profoundly kind of powerful meditation on all the temporal complexities of this term and how this term kind of in a way, as it were, flirts between a kind of death drive-ish thing and something that opens on to a future, as, as you were arguing towards the end, I especially like that sort of reparative dimension and the, the sort of movement towards Klein and that oscillation between the two positions and the movement towards the depressive position from the paranoid uh, schizoid position. Uh, I mean, I won't take a lot of time. I mean, we could, of course, have a lot of discussion coming from me and Swati, but I would rather not do that at the outset and just see what kind of questions we might have. I think, uh, yeah, Swati is having a question there. She's not able to uh, unmute herself as we have seen there's some uh, audio problem there. So let me just relay her question to you, uh, or it might be a comment uh, to you, Laura. So uh, Swati says, thank you for this one insightful talk. I was wondering if you or any member from the team of Waiting Times has had opportunity to interview people of different age groups about their experience of acquiring the habit of doom scrolling as a response to the stimulus of fear and anxiety. So Laura, mm. would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Um... I mean, no, we, I mean, it's something that someone should, should do, definitely. This, this uh, element of my, um, of my work has been more sort of theoretical and, and literary in, in focus, but certainly, um, I mean, Michael Flexer is my colleague on Waiting Times who's particularly interested in people's stories, and he has been working with um, a group of mostly older um, black women in London um, who have been, uh, um, who, who aren't particularly online actually, um, although they've got, they've got some kind of weird connection um, through their housing association, through the television, which is how Michael's been engaging with them. And he asked them what they would like to do um, uh, during the pandemic in terms of telling stories about waiting. And they told me they wanted to play bingo. So he played a lot of bingo with them. Um, and there was a lot of talking about the difficulties of waiting, the difficulties of connection and the needs to be caught in a, the, the need to remake something. So one of the really beautiful things that was made um, uh, for, uh, by one of um, Michael's um, uh, research participants was a quilt, a quilt about waiting. So a literal kind of stitch, um, practice of stitching, which I felt was very important. 
Yeah, how, how does one stitch time and all those ideas that you had in the paper? I, just a very quick comment before I, I think I have a raised hand here from the audience members. So uh, just a very quick comment. It was quite interesting, especially in the latter half of your talk, when you were commenting on racism, racial relations, racialization in a way as a process, because uh, there was quite a bit of discussion in India about the caste inflections that were kind of in, or reintroduced, I should say, during the pandemic with all this touching and the, the not touching question. Because I mean, mm. touch is the phenomenological vector by which the caste system operates in India, where certain castes are considered lower and untouchable uh, and, and others are considered perhaps more touchable. Uh, anyway, I mean, there was quite a bit of discussion, in fact, uh, uh, I kind of joined that or participated in a way in that discussion by writing something where uh, it was quite of interesting how in the first wave, especially, it was all very tactile. The whole dynamic was quite haptic, whereas, of course, you know, we moved into a more aerosol age, let's say, in the second wave, where it was kind of understood that it's not entirely or it's in fact very little of this has to do with touch, uh, the transmission mm -hmm. of COVID, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was quite interesting how uh, because caste and race do have certain kinds of analogies in the Indian and non-Indian contexts. So I was just kind of, you know, uh, fascinated by the racial language. Yeah, I'd love to read that, Orko, if you can send me the link, or uh, maybe yeah. put it in the chat. Um, I think um, I'm sure that's right, that, that you know, that these, um, these ways of understanding what it means to be in a world with others, you know, reanimate um, certain kinds of traditions around what gets to be clean, what gets to be dirty. Um, and I suppose one of the theoretically interesting things that has emerged from the pandemic and these kind of practices of radical withdrawal that have been asked for of, of people is also a different understanding of how one might be in contact with others that you know if we move into a kind of aerosol age that you you know you don't have to be touching the student you're in a class with in order to um share their air and what it means to to share the air and in the the longer version of this which has just been accepted for textual practice um the journal so it should be out in a few months, I guess. Um, I talk about um, Ashila Mbembe's uh, uh, essay, The Universal Right to Breath, right, right. where he um, articulates how think expanding the, co the conception of breath outwards from, uh, um, mm. from how it might traditionally have been formulated allows us to think through relationship between not only different um, uh, configurations of the human but also the more the relationship to the more than human world that if we understood everything as having a kind of right to breathe what sure. how would that change our way of thinking mm. about connection yeah yeah it makes me think i should read the I, I am aware of that essay but i don't think i've read that essay it's very short it's very yeah, good very yeah. short so yeah yeah yeah. yeah 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 because i i mean towards the end of that paper i did kind of get into this sharing of the air argument and to what extent this has also been theorized within caste studies as a sort mm. of understanding of caste, not just in that, you know, hyper haptic sense, but also in a more, you know, sharing the air kind of way. But anyway, mm. I, I think I'll open it up. Uh, I have a raised hand from, is it Des or Dave? I mean, Des? Des. Yes, Des, yeah. Hi, yeah. hi, hi. Thank, hi, thanks hi. so much. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for bringing me in. Thanks so much, Laura, and thanks to colleagues at the Medical Humanities Colloquy for, for such, a, such a stimulating event. Um, I, I, I just, Laura, I guess I wanted to push back, resist a little bit your reparative gesture at the end. Um, and I wanted to resist it partly by thinking about a term that overlaps, I think, a little bit with doom scrolling if it's not synonymous with it, which is hate reading. Um, and certainly a lot of my own doom scrolling is hate reading at the same time and is hate clicking. Um, and I guess the move from doom to hate is kind of it, it gestures at a kind of a different relationship to a producer of the content, right? So, so what motivates the hate, at least for me, is, is a sense of what I think the 
pr producer of the scrolling text is trying to produce and to constitute, which I think is quite intentionally often a field of anxiety, actually, um, for a whole bunch of reasons, partly to do with the economy of social media, partly to do with personal branding, a, a whole you know series of, of things. So as part of the question is, is, is to ask you about moving away from the kind of reader to the writer and to think about the kind of producer of these do me somewhat hateful texts as mm. kind of emerging genres of, of literary production, right, that are not unique to the pandemic, but have become very you know, prominent within it or have taken certain forms within it, I guess. One thinks of the thread emoji as the signal of a very particular kind of novel genre. So, yeah, it was just mm -hmm. a, a question that about kind of moving from the reader to the producer of the of the Doomy text, I yeah. guess, or how, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, I was thinking about my own practice that I'm not on Twitter, but there is someone who is actually an ex-colleague who uh, has gone full COVID denial, um, who I, I sort of slightly stalk on Twitter just to annoy, it's, is it just to annoy myself? I mean, that is definitely a kind of hate reading and I never say anything. I never say anything about it, but I sort of feel like I need to, I need to see what this person is saying in order to sort of see the limit of my kind of annoyance. At, <laughs> um, and they get to occupy a kind of psychical function in relation to that. But I don't, I don't say anything to them. They, they blocked me on Facebook after I, <laughs> after I had a back and forth with them. So yeah, I mean, what it, what's the purpose of writing um, in relation to this material? I mean, I think one of the interesting things about a lot of the writing that has gone on in relation to the pandemic is how people have wanted to occupy a position of, I am the one who is articulating the truth and who is, who is creating kind of just relations. Right. Now, my ex-colleague, I do not believe that is what they are, you know, I, I don't think that's the effect. I think right. their effect, and in fact, I said this to them, you're, the effect of you doing this is actually increasing people's anxiety. Um, and their response was that they uh, was something along the lines of, uh, you know, you're trying to cancel me, <laughs> um, which which I sort of wasn't, but I was, but I was trying to point out that 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 this person's idea of what they were doing was not. Um, it was producing different kinds of of effects. So I think it is what I, I think. What I see in the doom scrolling, but also potentially in these particular rather obsessive modes of writing is, is a kind of oscillation between something that is critical uh, and, and, and paranoid critique and something that is attempting the reparative. And I think if we just stay in the space of, um, I mean, there is hate, Klein would never be able to separate love, love and hate. They are always uh, in concert with one another. So um, I, what I didn't want to do is just to say, oh, doom scrolling is this sort of, um, you know, actually it's all reparative really, because it really isn't. Oh. It really isn't. Um, but it is, it, it does articulate some kind of relationship between the two, which I think is important in terms of understanding how mm. how we get to read and write online does that make sense absolutely yeah thank you thank you guys thank you so i have a couple of longish questions in the chat box which i would relay to laura uh mm. celine is the one asking the question and she says thank you for the stimulating paper i want to i wonder if you may or may not have changed your teaching practices syllabus and recommendations in your modules on literature according to your own experience and findings about doom scrolling and care. On a different topic, I was interested in the way doom scrolling was articulated in automatic terms early in the paper. Would you say doom scrolling is a sort of conditioned reflex to survive in pandemic times and closed spaces? Yeah, let's take mm. more at a time. I suppose that's the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think there is something that becomes sort of conditioned about it. I mean, one of the things I note in the longer version in the paper is sometimes I've, I don't know if other people have this. I'm actually reading a codex book and I find myself trying to scroll up it. I don't know if anyone else has ever had that, but I always feel sort of slightly ashamed when I when I find myself doing that because, you know, I, I, 
I, I feel like that is me sort of fully habituated uh, into a kind of automatic mode of trying to pull the world towards me as opposed to going out into the world. So that I guess that's maybe what the feeling of shame is about there. So I think there is something habituated and, and addictive in it, but also as someone like Balant says, in the addictive, there is also a gesture towards something that might be about taking care. Um, and in terms of changing my teaching practices, cinema, yeah, um, not so much yet, because I'm just clinging on to my teaching by my fingertips, uh, just sort of, <laughs> but um, I, 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 I do have a section, you know, on a, a course about digital reading right at the end of, uh, of a course, it's called Humanities After the Human. And, and it's, just, it's quite hard to find material actually um, that, speaks really well about the kind of phenomenology of reading on the internet and the experience of reading, but also pays attention to the differences between, you know, what's the difference between reading and swiping through memes? Or, or what's the difference between, um, I don't know, uh, you know, reading a novel on a Kindle or going down a rabbit hole, you know, and, uh, and actually, you know, that so yeah, I'm I'm looking for good sources on on that kind of uh, on that kind of stuff. Thank but thanks you. for the question. Let me just quickly go over to the next one. Uh, Sue Kim has a question. She says, "Thanks for the talk. Fascinated by 12th century practices of prayer. I wondered what kind of medical practices are linked with the doomsday thinking of that time, 12th century, and more generally." What are some parallels between the doomsday narrative now and then, as you see it? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a medievalist, but um, I think I think in terms of medical practices, obviously, in that period, you can't separate prayer from um, from medical practice and the idea of patients as a kind of uh, um, Christ-like suffering endurance is very Im important in earlier um, sort of pre-modern uh, accounts. Um, I mean, one of the things I became very interested in uh, was things called uh, things like bead rolls, which I didn't end up talking about, but I, I became interested in, in bead rolls, which are about um, uh, after someone has died, um, putting their names down uh, in order that they then may be prayed for and that they will come to have account, be accountable uh, or they will be looked after, I suppose, when doomsday comes. So I think those, and I, th and I think those practices can be tracked across different cultures, actually, not just, um, I mean, this sort of Western European version of it is the bead roll, but I think there are other sort of such, Kind of cognate practices in other um, in other cultures, which is is about taking care of of the dead, the already dead, in order that when the time of judgment might come, something may be kind of gathered up for them. Um, more generally, what are the parallels between the doomsday narrative now and then? Um, in the longer version of this piece, uh, I become I, I I go to Giorgio Agamben's The Time That Remains. And Agamben talks there about this strange time after Jesus has been born, so after the Messiah has come, but before the second coming, which is the articulation of doomsday, so that we are in a time where we know that the end, we are in the end times, uh, the time, he says, the time that time takes to come to an end. And I would say that there are some very interesting links between that and feelings around climate change, for example. You know, the idea that we are or, you know, already in these end times and how do, we, how do we make things count, even if it's too late, I guess, might be one of the things that these medieval, I mean, the, the sort of medieval sense is very interesting because, you know, time, there's a sense that at any moment the second coming might come and you need to be sort of ready for it um, but also that it might of course carry on for a long time 
uh, so sort of protracted imminence is what Agamben calls it. But that, I mean, he's very interesting, I think, on, on this idea of the end times and the time that remains and what we do with the time that remains. But thank you for the question. Thanks. That's a nice segue because I was kind of thinking about that essay when you were talking about yet time in the paper. Uh, mm. I mean, essay, it's, it's also essay, I mean, it's a book length essay, uh, Time That Remains, but I was, I was thinking about that text by Agamben actually. In, it's a nice segue because there's another little comment which I actually missed in the chat box. I'm sorry about that. Anu has uh, connected uh, your paper and this idea with messianic time. With, mm -hmm. you know, again, connecting Benjamin, Derrida, Agamben, that entire thread, there's some yeah. sort of a connection there with the time to come and the weak messianic time and, and all, of, all of that. And I think she has also pointed us to the film, The Last Supper from 1976, mm -hmm. which she was reminded of while you were, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's a comment, so we may not go into yeah. a further discussion, but- I mean, the, <laughs> the, only, the only thing I will say to that is again, in, in the longer version of this paper, it is a very long, uh, it's about 13,000 words actually, so it is gonna be a long article. Um, I have a, a section on Benjamin's idea of yet sites, so yet time, and what Benjamin calls now time, right. uh, and um, so how, uh, yeah, what what the relationship might be between uh, Benjamin's notion of yet site as as a time when the past and the present get kind of reconfigured in a different kind of uh, of constellation. They're sort of brought together to, in order to do something different with time. Um, but I don't think, I don't think the moment of doom scrolling has quite the uh, messianic function, I guess, of uh, Benjamin's now time or Yeats site, but it's, uh, it, it, there's a very interesting link, I think, between them. Right, right. And I, I think I just shared the, the link to the paper that I wrote for European Thank Journal you. of Psychoanalysis. It was primarily on haptics, but I did consider the air towards the end as we mm. were moving from the first to the second wave. But anyway, uh, just uh, I think Angel has a question. I'll move over to that. But uh, before that, one very, just a very brief point. In fact, uh, one of the really interesting things that struck me about the paper in a sort of Borgesian sense about that book of sand, how reading doesn't quite end and strolling goes on forever, is that kind of dialectic between closure, not, not exactly closure, but let's say termination, doom, mm. and the, the idea of infinity that you were evoking with the endlessness of scrolling. So how mm. the endlessness and the ending kind of came together in that idea of an ending time, of perpetually ending time, as it were. You know, the, mm. the, the endlessly ending breath or that expression in Beckett somewhere, I can't remember where, but uh, it, it's, 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 it's something that struck me. Uh, Angel, mm. please go ahead. I mean, if you have a question, I think you have a raised hand, so go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this uh, talk, Laura. This was so fascinating. But the question that I have is uh, slightly maybe moving away from the idea of uh, doom scrolling as, you know, consumption of negative news. Because especially in the first wave of uh, the pandemic in India, one of the things that we noticed was on platforms like Instagram and Twitter, for instance, there was this explosion of people putting out posts about productivity. So all the things that they did during the day, so like baking, cooking, painting, and that was a very obsessive kind of thing. And everybody kept track of it in a very obsessive sense. And uh, although it is not negative news, it was still a kind of doom scrolling because doom scrolling because even at night you'd simply be looking at what are the productive things that people are doing and in some sense at night especially you know uh, be scared to stop uh, stop this scrolling because you're worried you know you'll wake up the next day and you might not be as productive as that person so for people who are already have anxiety and other things this is also a kind of doom scrolling right although it is not necessarily negative news so I was just wondering if you know that's something that you've come across or thought about in, in the term of waiting time. Yeah, I think we definitely saw that in the UK as well. Um, and you know, sort of um and, and lots of um articles in the first wave of the pandemic about how you know maybe lockdown was really good for us, it got us, you know, got us to slow down and got us to connect with what really matters, but that 
I agree with what you're suggesting that there was a, a certain kind of performance of uh, of productivity that actually <laughs> was completely doing the opposite thing to um, a real inhabiting, I suppose, of the um, of, of a withdrawal from the demand to be uh, productive. Um, and I suppose I, I suppose how I would read that is probably linking it up to this idea of create of um, making things count or that the anxiety to make things count in some kind of way a sort of psych making it register psychically as something that that counts and isn't just going to get kind of swept away so i think you know if you post the, posting on instagram or on facebook it's something like I, I was here, I, I did something, something important happened, somebody witnessed it, and somebody has witnessed it. And I think that it is this process of, of wanting to connect with a kind of witnessing in order to produce something that counts. Um, and we can think about that, of course, algorithmically as well in terms of cert certain kinds of ma mathematical counting um i think that's i think that's part of what's been what's at work there i suppose but thanks for your question that's really thank helpful you. thank you so much no it is fascinating thank you thank you Indu. uh do we have any more questions from the floor i'm just looking through the profile pictures making sure i'm not missing out a raised hand but i don't think we have anything in the chat box either. Is there any last question that someone would like to ask? We might have time for one final question if there is any. Okay. It seems like all questions are answered. <laughs> Thank you so as much. In, as in the last judgment, <laughs> all questions are answered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It just uh, leaves me with the, the, the yet time to thank you for taking time out for your, from your schedule. And it's been, of course, very hectic for most of us for various reasons uh, for a long, long time. In fact, one of the things that I think I started with is this a subjective sense of elasticized time that I personally felt throughout these two years. I can't even remember the old normal, so to speak, you know, when things were different before. And I remember it, it's kind of funny that we were doing a conference right at that point, 2020, uh, in March. And after that, things just completely got disjointed. Uh, Mark, in fact, was one of the keynotes in that conference. He came over to India. And after that, everything kind of went completely all right. And so for some reason, I'm still thinking of this entire time of more than two years now, I really don't know where this time has gone. I, I somehow in my mind, it's a dislocation. It, this is something else. Until and unless we go back to the so-called old normal, if ever we do, uh, on a hopeful note, let's say when we go back to the old normal, maybe that's when I'll sort of relocate myself in the old time. You know, mm. uh, I can see there's some chats here. It's all thanks, I guess. I'm uh, just checking I, in case I'm not missing out on a question. Uh, and just yeah. just thank <laughs> you. Thank you to everybody um, for your questions. It's re always really helpful. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, which I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you all and to, and to connect. I mean, one of the good things I guess we can say is that, you know, we are now able, we're much more uh, um, able to, connect across continents yeah. and, and be confident about doing that. And that really is a um, something that's worth having. Right, right. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, I again, thank you for being part of this Medical Humanities Colloquy, which we hope to continue with discussions as enriching as this. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us.
I don't think I ever introduced myself, but I guess my profile name is already there. I kind of just completely forgot about introducing myself. But anyway, I'm Orko Chattopatya and I teach in the Humanities and Social Sciences Department. However bizarre this might sound at the end of the event, let me just finish with that. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you everyone who came in and asked questions and engaged in a wonderful discussion. So yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Swati and everyone else for helping me organize this.